Abaddon the Despoiler is the primary villain of the Warhammer 40k setting, and surprisingly, he's also one of its most controversial characters. Now, on the surface, this guy seems absolutely ruthless, insanely powerful, and one of the largest threats that the Imperium has ever seen. Yet the memes people make about him paint a completely different picture. They show him being worthless, a terrible villain, and one of the most ineffective antagonists that has ever been created. But where does all the hate for Abaddon actually come from? Now, many Warhammer fans claim that he is the victim of aggressive retconning by Games Workshop, that in his original lore, he was presented as an abject failure and the company basically had to take 30 years of storytelling, completely overhaul it, and pretend like he was this secret mastermind all along. At least that's what they claim, but is there any truth to this? This is kind of a new series I've been kicking around for a while, where we take a meme or misconception about the franchise and kind of push back on it a bit. And what better place to start than with Failbadon the Harmless? So in today's video, we're gonna try to get to the source of this by determining what lore about Abaddon was actually retconned, and see if there's any validity to these memes claims, or if they're all just based on misconceptions. But first, a quick shout out to this video's sponsor, and then we're gonna dive headfirst into the grimdark. This video is brought to you by Raid Shadow Legends, an awesome and free-to-play RPG with millions of players that's available on both mobile and PC. With hundreds of artifacts to equip on over 600 champions, you can build your team and raid your way. My favorite part about Raid is just how cool and interesting their champions are. So here's a list of my top three most badass looking champions. In third place, we have Harvest Jack. He's got that whole spooky Halloween thing going on that I'm a big fan of. In second place, we have Roxxon, as the Lizardmen have always been one of my favorite fantasy species. And in first place, it's Crutraxa. And I mean, how could it not be? Just look at her. Everything about her aesthetic is awesome. Also, Raid's got something really special for new players this Christmas. If you download Raid from December 19th until January 10th, then copy your player ID from in-game, you can go to 12daysofraid.polarium.com, where you can take part in a brand new minigame for a chance to win some amazing prizes, including holiday-themed champions. And speaking of champions, Raid has just released a free legendary champion based off of MMA and wrestling legend Ronda Rousey. To get her for free, all you have to do is log in and play Raid for seven days, between now and February 20th. So click the link in the description or scan the QR code on the screen to download Raid today. New and existing players can use the promo code RAIDRONDA to get all of these goodies here on screen and level her up super fast. On top of that, new players can get a free starter pack worth $30. That includes a free epic champion, Virgis, 200k silver, 1 energy refill, 1 XP boost, and 1 ancient shard. You'll find all these rewards here for the next 30 days. Thanks again to Raid Shadow Legends for sponsoring this video. Now before we start getting into the nitty gritty of what is and isn't a retcon, we need to have a fundamental understanding of what the Black Crusades were. We'll do a deep dive on the Black Legion and Abaddon as a character in a later video, but for now, I'm just going to assume that you at least know who the Despoiler is. Now one of the largest misconceptions about Abaddon centers around those Black Crusades. Most people assume that each and every one of them was its own self-contained war, each of them with the ultimate goal of the destruction of Terra and the toppling of the Imperium. Now, despite this common sentiment, this wasn't exactly the case, as Abaddon had different smaller objectives that he would end up accomplishing with each and every one of them, each successful crusade building upon its predecessor to finally come together in the 13th, which saw the fortress world of Cadia destroyed and the Eye of Terror growing out of control and the forming of the Cicatrix Melodictum that would end up splitting the galaxy in half. Now, despite the 13th's devastating outcome, the Long War, as it is known, was far from over, and the 13th existed as only another stepping stone in Abaddon's grand plans. Despite the Despoiler being the figurehead of the Crusades, there were many other warlords that were involved as well, each and every one of them pursuing their own objectives. The Thousand Sun Sorcerer Iskandar Kane remarks on this in the Black Legion novel, how each of these events was absolutely massive, and that all of the figures acting in them had their own goals and ideals to pursue. A one warlord may have sought to only do as much damage to the Imperium as possible, while another may have attempted to ignite a cult uprising on a certain sector. Chaos isn't exactly known for unity, and it's more accurate to think of a Black Crusade as hundreds of thousands of smaller wars being waged by different individuals at different scales, all of which contributed to the whole of the Black Crusade itself. From Abaddon's perspective, each of the campaigns was a single act in a larger picture that would last 10,000 years, but on the smaller scale, each of those individual warbands and warlords were fighting their own campaigns and wars within the larger crusade itself. It's wars within wars within wars, which honestly is pretty appropriate for Warhammer. 
Because there are so many moving parts, it's difficult to give a definitive statement on the overall successfulness of each of the Black Crusades, as it would vary from warlord to warlord. One would say it was an absolute failure, as the Imperium had crushed all of their forces, while another would claim that it had been an outright victory, as their warband was successfully able to destroy a planet or two. If you were to ask the Imperium, the first 12 Black Crusades would have been failures, as they managed to stand in defiance of the Chaos Invaders and push them back. But if you were to ask Abaddon, they had all been ultimately successful, as all of the other warbands had served their purpose as being a distraction, while he would then in turn go on to accomplish his secret objectives. So let's take a look at each one of these crusades to see what they were all about and what exactly Abaddon managed to accomplish. These objectives range from the claiming of the demonic sword Drachnian, taking control of some of the Blackstone Fortresses, which are one of the most powerful superweapons in the entire galaxy, the taking of the Blood Angel's Gene Seed, to even the abducting of a bunch of orcs to do experiments on in the 11th Black Crusade. I'll make a more detailed video on all of the Crusades and their outcomes in the future, but for now, here's just a quick screenshot from the Lexiconum that gives you an idea of what they were all about and their dates. If you're hearing all of this for the first time, it seems pretty cut and dry there doesn't really seem to be a lot of room for confusion on who Abaddon is as a character or the overall plot. Uh, but this is a story that has been being written for over 30 years, and it's one that's incredibly difficult to actually keep track of, as each piece of the narrative is spread out over dozens if not hundreds of different articles and books, each one of them giving us an incomplete picture. This in turn shows us the biggest flaw with how Warhammer presents its storytelling, and more importantly to this video, how Abaddon is written as a character. To be fair, it's not just Abaddon that suffers from this type of storytelling, as it also applies to pretty much any legacy character that has a major impact on the storyline, particularly characters that are portrayed as not being one-dimensional or existing solely for the purpose of moving a single plot forward. The confusion is exacerbated even further by inconsistencies in the narrative given to characters in different sources. With Abaddon in particular, there seemed to be a really big change from who he was during the Horus Heresy to who he is now in the 42nd millennium. But with the exception of Talon of Horus and the Black Legion by Aaron Dimsky Bowden, two books that shed light on who he was around the time of the First Black Crusade, we aren't really shown this character progression. We're just told that it happened. In the context of 40K and other literature, the idea of telling and not showing normally takes the form of us just being told a bunch of really crazy things happened, but we don't really get to see those things happen in something like a novel. This is what a lot of people like to refer to as exposition dumps. Although exposition dumps are a classic example of bad writing, this isn't exactly a problem for 40K. And that's for a couple of reasons. The first is that you could make the argument that the lore section of a codex is in its entirety an exposition dump. And this is where a good amount of people primarily get their lore. And on the other hand, with just how spread out all of the lore for each and every character within 40K is, very few of us have actually read everything revolving around a certain character. My own personal example of this would be with the character Fabius Bile as I've read his entire trilogy multiple times, and I've seen him show up in many of the Horus Heresy novels and short stories. But I know that I haven't read every single thing that the character has ever appeared in, whether it be in a campaign book, White Dwarf article, or another novel that I just hadn't read yet. I'm aware that there are gaps in my knowledge with this character, and getting a synopsis of these stories from something like a codex, a Wikipedia article, a lore video, a discussion on an online forum, or even just from a friend, helped me fill in those blanks. We all do this all the time. And it's just kind of the nature of the beast when being a fan of the 40k lore. The problem with this is that Fabius Bile is not Abaddon the Despoiler, the primary antagonist of 40k, and arguably one of the most important characters in the entire setting next to Gilliman and the Emperor himself. They did a fantastic job explaining Gilliman's motivations, thoughts, and ideas in the Dark Imperium trilogy, and it allowed us to get a better understanding of the differences between him and 30k and where we find ourselves in the 40k storyline. Personally, I believe we need a similar trilogy for Abaddon, as the standard Games Workshop format of storytelling, where a character's journey is spread out over multiple cameos and dozens of different novels, multiple White Dwarf articles, and tons of different campaign books is not practical for a character that is supposed to be that important to the story. All that being said, GW's unorganized storytelling format is not the main criticism when it comes to Abaddon. It's that he seemingly has been retconned into being successful by a major portion of the community. Many Warhammer fans believe that he was originally portrayed as worthless and ineffective, unworthy of the lofty title of main antagonist of Warhammer 40k. And through the sneaky use of aggressive retconning, Games Workshop is now trying to pass him off as this secretly awesome character who was never a failure, but was actually playing 12-dimensional chess behind the scenes all along. 
Personally, retcons have never bothered me, if it makes the story better and more concise, but some Warhammer fans absolutely hate when anything in the lore gets changed. And this isn't me criticizing them, I actually understand that. And I think being frustrated by changing lore, especially in a universe this difficult to keep track of, is a completely valid position to take. Now that being said, I think we should do our due diligence to find out what things about Abaddon are actually retcons or just misconceptions. And in order to do that, we need to define what a retcon really is. According to Oxford, in film, television series, or fictional works, a retcon is a piece of new information that imposes a different interpretation on previously described events, typically used to facilitate dramatic plot shifts or accounts in inconsistency. You could make the argument that any piece of lore released after the rogue trader days of 40k is in fact a retcon if it adds more context. Since this is a pretty broad definition, we're going to simplify it down to a Warhammer retcon being something that changes or alters the lore to not just add context, but to completely rewrite something so aggressively that it invalidates previously written lore to the point where the two interpretations are incompatible with one another. A recent example of a hard retcon like this was with the Dark Imperium trilogy, which if you didn't know, and this was actually kind of news to me, it had to be re-released to move its events and the timeline back. As in its original publication, it was stated that they occurred 100 years after the destruction of Cadia, and this was changed to be only 12 years. This is a hard retcon, as the timeline has been fundamentally changed and the two dates are not compatible. An example of a soft retcon would be something being stated in the lore 20 years ago and a newly published work expands on it, while still leaving anything that was previously published unchanged. I don't really consider that a retcon. I'm aware that I'm narrowing down the definition of retcon to fit the confines of this video, but if I don't do this, then every single Horus Heresy book could be technically flagged as a retcon, as the very first thing ever written about it was just a single paragraph that said that Horus was a space marine that turned against the Emperor. The Primarchs weren't even a thing, Lehman Russ was just considered to be a general in the Imperial Army. So by the more broad definition, every single book that has come out would be retconning, and to label them as such, I just don't really feel it's very constructive. So let's take a look at some of the most common retcons that people point to when talking about Abaddon. The Black Crusades were not failures, but were secret victories. This is the most common element that detractors of the character like to point to, the age-old meme that Games Workshop had to rewrite the lore in order to make Abaddon successful, as all of his crusades to destroy Terra were ultimately failures. In order to get to the bottom of this, we're going to have to go back to the very beginning and see where Abaddon came from. Pictured here on screen is a page from the 3rd edition Chaos Space Marines Codex, published in 1999. Now, it specifically mentions that Abaddon personally led 12 of the Black Crusades, and that each and every one of them was ultimately pushed back by the Imperium, but at great cost. This passage alludes to many of the victories that Abaddon achieved in all of these Crusades, but it doesn't say which prizes were claimed in which Crusade, or that all of the fighting and raiding done by the other Chaos Space Marines was only meant as a distraction. It informs the reader that Abaddon was able to claim the demonic sword Drachnian, but it doesn't really give us a lot of context. If we go back even further to the second edition Chaos Space Marines Codex that was released in 1996, we can see a very similar paragraph. It mentions the same stuff while keeping it very vague and cryptic. If we were to jump forward to the 8th edition Chaos Space Marines Codex, which came out in 2018, we're given a similar paragraph to the ones that came before, but with a few notable exceptions. The first is that the 13th Black Crusade, as well as the ones that came before, are further expanded upon. It spells it out for us that they were building blocks to eventually herald in the destruction of Cadia, the forming of the Great Rift, and the eventual collapse of the Imperium. A lot of the vagueness from earlier entries has been stripped away here. Now, if you were to have jumped from one of these codexes to the 8th edition codex, this would seem like a retcon. But the codexes are not the only source of lore. In fact, if we look at a more obscure source from 2003, the Libra Chaotica Book 1 Corn, we can see a person giving us a vague description of each one of the Black Crusades through prophetic visions. Meaning that even at this time, these being secret victories that were all building up to the 13th had already been established. And I think we should establish something real quick about when people are complaining about retcons with Abaddon, they're normally pointing to 2017's The Gathering Storm. Most of the time they're not referring to lore that came from 3rd or 4th edition in the early 2000s. As most people understand that the universe really hadn't been fleshed out that much in like 1st and 2nd edition. So as we talk about this book, bear in mind that the Libra Chaotica came out in 2003. I don't like putting anybody on blast because that's not my style. 
And I don't think it's really fair to criticize somebody for not having read every piece of obscure media that exists in 40K. But this is an article from the Bell of Lost Souls that claims that everything about Abaddon and all of the Crusades had been retconned. And they're specifically citing the 2019 Chaos Space Marine Codex as the primary source of these retcons. The article's kind of written with a snarky tone and says that Abaddon is the king of retcons. That his 13 Black Crusades are the source of the most self-corrected retconning in history. The article then goes on to list each one of these crusades and then mentions what Abaddon managed to achieve with each and every one of them. That the commonly held belief that Abaddon had failed 12 times in a row was being retconned by Games Workshop. It concludes by telling the viewers, like it or not, this is all now considered canon based on the 2019 Chaos Space Marines Codex. But it's not. It's been considered canon since at least 2003. Because if we open up the Libra Chaotica, it spells out pretty much everything that happened in each of the Crusades. And goes into a pretty decent amount of detail. In the First Crusade, it talks about how they would have escaped to the Eye of Terror and everybody believed that they were dead, but they were going to be wrong. Which is exactly what happens with Sigismund, who believes that they're still out there, and leads a crusade in order to track down Abaddon, even though the rest of the Imperium believes they've died. Like, there's actually a surprising amount of detail here, and shows Games Workshop had a plan for Abaddon at least as far back as 20 years ago. There's a couple events in here, like the Host of Talamon, where it says that the narrator can't really see clearly what's going to happen, but he can just see that the Wolf Warriors are going to be important. But for the most part, this is pretty informative. So when people make the claim that all of these crusades are retcons, I can kinda understand where they're coming from because they most likely didn't read this book. Most people probably don't even know that it exists. And it's not really fair to criticize somebody for only having read their codexes or the novels that were released around the same time when they were actively playing. But the cold hard truth is that it does exist. So none of these are actually retcons. At most, it's just evidence of Games Workshop putting some pretty important story details that would have been nice to have in the earlier codexes in a super obscure art book that no one's going to read. And then correcting that mistake years later by adding them to the new codex, which created a lot of confusion with the fan base and honestly, probably wasn't a great idea in retrospect. Another one of these claims that's kind of in the same vein is the Blackstone Pylons on Cadia having been one of the major retcons around Abaddon. The Blackstone Pylons are massive monolithic structures that dot the surface of Cadia and many other planets throughout the galaxy. The material that they're made of has the remarkable ability to channel and amplify the energy of the warp or outright nullify it, depending on how it's charged. They're seen as the major contributing factor to how the fortress world of Cadia was able to stand right outside the Eye of Terror, even though by all accounts, the radiating warp energy coming off of it should have made this impossible. Many Warhammer fans have pointed to their existence as a retcon, that the pylons didn't exist in the old lore, and they were invented simply to give Abaddon some type of MacGuffin that he needed to destroy in order to win. This is not true. Cadia's pylons have existed in the lore for at least 20 years. They were mentioned in the Eye of Terror campaign book from 2003, and they were one of the primary plot devices in the Eisenhorn book series that was released around the same time. Not to mention, they would be fleshed out even further in 2005 in the 13th Black Crusade background book by Andy Hoare. Each of these sources lining up pretty precisely with their descriptions from the Gathering Storm era, but we'll get to that in a little bit. If one was to only have read their descriptions in the campaign books, they would get a very cryptic mention about their purpose, following up with statements like, some theorized that, or legend has it. But what they are and what they do is still being spelled out for us. This is made abundantly apparent in Eisenhorn, as the story's primary antagonist wants to recreate them to use them as a weapon. A consequences be damned. That's not to say that the pylons lore has never changed, as it would be expanded upon greatly in The Gathering Storm, as well as in the 8th edition Necron Codex. It had never really been stated that the Necrons were the ones who made them, but judging by the early artwork of the pylons, it's not a difficult assumption to have made at the time that it was written. The Necron Codex states that their purpose was to create a vast network of stable real space, immune to the Immaterium's influence. While in The Gathering Storm, they would become incredibly important to Cadia's ultimate destruction. Their importance has been spelled out for us for years, and simply moving the story forward to actually involve them, or changing who originally created them, doesn't really do anything to alter Abaddon's story arc. So the pylons are also not a retcon. If somebody didn't know that a lot of these things had been previously established, you could see all of them as major retcons. But the biggest by far is the idea that the 13th Black Crusade actually came to an end in 2003, and that Abaddon had failed to destroy Cadia. 
This claim can trace its origins back to the Eye of Terror campaign from the early 2000s, a campaign that seemingly had its ending changed over a decade later. I cannot stress enough just how absolutely insane this campaign really was, and it honestly deserves its own video, but I'll summarize it here for those of you who were not in the fandom at the time. The campaign was supposed to represent the 13th Black Crusade, and saw the entirety of the galaxy engulfed in war. Every single faction played a prominent role, and players were able to upload their victories and defeats to an online database. When certain factions were successful in certain sectors, this would have direct consequences that GW promised would have long-reaching implications on the lore going forward. And I can't really put into words just how massive and ambitious this project was. Never before had anything like this been done in the tabletop gaming space, at least not to this ridiculous scale. It's impossible to determine just how many players participated in the events, but over the eight weeks that the campaign ran, Games Workshop received over a quarter of a million game results. The end result was that by all intents and purposes, it had been a draw, though they did mention that the forces of chaos had managed to gain a foothold on the world of Cadia. But it was very much not destroyed, and maybe that's more of a testament to the superb game balancing skills of the old design team, but it certainly was an anticlimactic conclusion. Many people took these results as canon, but if I'm being honest with you, I don't actually know if this is true. And throughout all of my research, I've been unable to find an answer. I'll admit I took a break from playing 40K between 6th and 7th edition, uh, mostly because the rules were bad. So the time period that would have incorporated all of the results from the end of the Eye of Terror campaign is an era that I wasn't exactly paying close attention to the lore in. So I've had to do a lot of looking back at old lore in order to kind of fill in these blanks for myself. I haven't been able to find any references to the 13th Black Crusade coming to a close, with the Chaos Space Marines shaking their fists and vowing to return one day, before disappearing into the Eye of Terror. It seems like it really was just a storyline that was left hanging for over a decade, that the results were never canonized. In fact, when you look at the Chaos Space Marine Codex from 4th, 5th, and 6th edition, they refer to the 13th as if it is still ongoing, even though the campaign had come to a conclusion and Games Workshop had posted its results multiple years prior. As far as these codexes were concerned, Abaddon's forces were still currently fighting against the Imperium on the surface of Cadia. Now that would all change in 2017, when a three-part campaign that started with the book Gathering Storm was released. Now this book recontextualized the events of the Eye of Terror campaign, while seeing it eventually accumulate in the destruction of Cadia and the forming of the Cicatrix Maledictum. So is it fair to call this a retcon? It directly contradicts the results posted on GW's website from a 20-year-old player event, but those results don't seem to have ever been interwoven into the actual universe of Warhammer, at least as far as the destruction of Cadia is concerned, as I believe they actually did use a lot of the results from the campaign to flavor certain types of lore that came in the future, like the Thousand Suns being in the webway. It's a weird situation, and I'm just speculating here, but I feel like the idea of having real games directly influence the future of Warhammer 40k was a fantastic idea in concept, but when they ended up with a draw, Games Workshop didn't really know what to do. Say what you will about the narrative of the Gathering Storm campaign, and we definitely will in a video in the future, as there's a lot to cover, and there's even more so that can be objectively and fairly criticized. But in terms of Abaddon achieving victory over Cadia, it just doesn't read as a retcon. It reads as the conclusion of a story arc that was left hanging for far too long. To close this out, I wanted to share with you a really interesting quote that was posted on Aaron Dembski Bowden's WordPress. He talks about the difficulties in writing the book Talon of Horus, and he alludes to the fact that everyone who contributes to the Warhammer lore has meetings all the time behind the scenes, discussing the setting and all of the characters within it. He tells us that there were two major problems with writing about Abaddon as a character. The first was that his lore was spread out over so many different sources in so many different years that it was difficult to narrow down what exactly needed to be focused on. But the other major problem with the character was that he was the victim of a barrage of comedy memes, most of the which spread misunderstandings and misconceptions about the character. He doesn't exactly tell us where this comes from, but he alludes to the fact that it is a behind the scenes collective archive, something that I would assume the lore masters use when they're making new books. It's a passage about the despoiler that resonated with him, and he says he hopes that we'll find it as inspiring as he did. Quote, Horus was weak. Horus was a fool. It sums up Abaddon. Horus allowed himself to be used by chaos. Horus is the chaos power's dupe to get back at the emperor. Now, Abaddon will never let this happen. He will never allow himself to be a pawn of chaos. Simply surviving without choosing one as a patron is a massive achievement, never succumbing to the temptation of becoming a demon prince's second. Seriously, Abaddon is so driven he'd rather battle and scrape and bite and claw his way up to achieve his goals on his own terms than achieve immortality and virtually limitless power, because the alternative 
is to open the slightest chink in its independence that the Chaos Gods would exploit. If Horus was the vessel that all of the gods poured their power into, right up until they abandoned him at the end, then Abaddon has become the vessel that the gods want to have for themselves, but haven't been able to claim. They've all offered him a chance to be their region, to rule in their name, and he has turned them all down, playing them off each other. He is the new emperor in a way that Horus never was or would have been able to be. Abaddon has, through sheer force of will and dominance, made himself more than a pawn. He has made himself a kingmaker. If he was to choose one god to serve, if he dedicated the Black Legion to a single power in his name, that god would crush his rivals almost to the point of victory. Almost. Because Chaos can never win against itself, of course, and Abaddon has seen the truth of this. He knows that Chaos is a process, a state, not a goal. And the moment anyone surrenders the journey and forgets the destination is the moment their worldly ambitions are forgotten and their spirits become simply a part of the Chaos powers. Abaddon is utterly relentless in his pursuits of what he wants. Whatever that may actually be, revenge on the Emperor? Too petty. Vengeance for Horus? Too sentimental. Power? Yes. But what kind of power? Mortal power. He could have all of the immortal power he can handle if he but asks for it. But that is not what drives him. He sees the Primarchs disappear, fade, die, or simply not care anymore. And he understands that only a man can really rule other men. Abaddon doesn't want to destroy the Imperium. He wants to succeed where Horus failed. He wants to be Emperor and have mankind bow beneath his rule. His rule, not the rule of the Chaos Gods. Abaddon has not failed because he is willful or incompetent. He has mustered the greatest army since the Heresy and unleashed them upon the material universe. He has amassed power and influence within the Eye of Terror greater than any Primarch. He has done this through feet of arms and personality. But the only thing he can never truly do, because it's anathema to chaos, is truly unite the ruinous powers. They can only come together in dominance, not subservience. Whenever Abaddon has been on the brink of victory, his backers break ranks, seeking to gain some last-minute short-term advantage. Ultimately, a win for Abaddon is a loss for chaos. If he becomes emperor, he has everything he desires, and they can hold nothing over him. And so they continue to dangle the carrot, continue to be his patrons, giving him demonic power and servants, ordering their mortal representatives to debase themselves and serve his will, all in the hope of snatching the final victory of Abaddon for themselves. It is the office politics of hell, literally. One of the beliefs surrounding Satan in many Christian theologies is that his defiance of God was his refusal to bow to man when they were created. And refusing to submit to the rule of mortals, Abaddon carries this analogy perfectly. The legions of Stardes were created by a god and were never meant to be corralled and curtailed by purely mortal ambitions. As angels, they have a higher purpose, and once had a higher regard in the eyes of their creator, who shunned them. Quite how much of this Abaddon realizes when Horus fails and how much he learns over the next 10,000 years, or three days depending on warp time, is narratively elastic. Bearing in mind the warp or real interface, being the bearer of the mark of chaos ascendant, or just having a shiny star of chaos imprinted on one's forehead, it is when the Chaos Gods are bestowing their blessings or energy. To be the center of a blazing star, to be surrounded by a coil of ever-replenishing Chaos energy, heralded by a choir of demons of all powers, sufficed with the essence of four great Chaos Gods. To each worshiper and follower, he appears different, much like the Emperor. He is a schemer, a warrior, self-centered iconoclast, and a survivor. But there are times, after the effort, the glory, of being the conduit of so much power, when he teeters on the precipice of doubt, madness, and physical corruption, he stands between mortals and immortals, his ambition far beyond the understanding of the first, yet incomprehensibly alien to the second. And constantly he is failed by the inherent weakness of both. His enemies circle, material and immaterial, sensing potential weakness. His allies start to disappear. For a while, the Chaos powers are disinterested, choosing to split, becoming self-serving once more, raising up their champions, sometimes alone, sometimes together, hoping these mortals will rival Abaddon, yet they never do. And he wonders if it is vanity. He wonders if he is deserving. He wonders if what he wants is possible. And then the powers come back, trying once more to win him over to their cause, taunting, threatening, cajoling, and coercing Abaddon to become theirs and theirs alone. And he listens, and he wonders, and always from somewhere deep in his soul, from the darkest yet strongest place in his mind, the answer comes back, hesitant, but growing louder with every beat of his twin hearts. Yes, yes, one day it will all be yours. And he starts the struggle again, and the long war continues.
At the end of this video, if somebody still doesn't like Abaddon as a character, I think that's valid. Taste is objective, and not every character is going to resonate with everybody exactly the same way. I've personally always been a big fan of the villains, but I have some friends in my Discord that the fact that they're traitors makes them basically unlikable no matter what happens in their story. And although that's not a stance that I personally take, I think it's completely reasonable. If you read a book about a character and you claim that you don't like them, anybody trying to tell you that you're wrong for not liking something is an idiot. That's some gatekeeping nonsense, and you're entitled to like or dislike anything you choose. But aside from the Warhammer fans that don't like any traitor no matter what for any reason, a lot of the hate for Abaddon seems to come from a lot of misconceptions about the character that have been perpetuated into oblivion by a bunch of memes. The only problem I actually have with this is when somebody adamantly hates something and tries to tell other people that they're wrong for liking it by pointing to memes as their primary argument for why they're a bad character. There's a lot of misconceptions about Abaddon as a character, and to be fair, a lot of that is Games Workshop's fault with just how they present their lore. I thought this was going to be a super quick video that I just look at a meme and try to disprove it or try to play devil's advocate, which I really enjoy doing, but this ended up being a much bigger project than I realized. I had to download like 30 different PDFs of old codexes, old campaign books, archived articles from Games Workshop. It was, it was ridiculous. And a regular person shouldn't have to do that much work to understand a character. So it's pretty obvious where a lot of these memes come from. Like I'm not faulting the people who made them necessarily because it's hard to keep track of all of this. So hopefully this video was able to clarify some stuff for you. Personally, I think that Abaddon is actually a really interesting and endearing character and I'm excited to see where they go with him in the next couple of years. But anyways, at the end of all of this, what do you think? Do you agree with me that Abaddon is actually a solid and interesting character and has just been done dirty by the memes? Or do you disagree and think that he's one of the worst characters in the entire setting and needs to be done away with? If you think that, what would you do to make him a better character? How would you fix Abaddon? Are there any characters that you think would make a better primary antagonist in Warhammer 40k? And whether you like him or dislike him, what are some things that you hope to see in the future with Chaos versus the Imperium? Thanks again for watching the video all the way through. And if you managed to make it this far, you might as well go ahead and click the like button. And if you haven't subscribed to my channel already, you should go ahead and retcon that by clicking on the subscribe button. <laughs> I'm sorry, that was terrible. Anyways, that's all I had to say about this. I'll catch y'all on the next one.